welcome to another episode of In Focus brought to you by the Uongozi Institute. I am your host, Bomaka Kifukwe. On tonight's program, we'll be looking to understand whether or not Africa is ready for economic transformation and what are the underlying factors and fundamentals that will determine whether or not Africa can successfully transform as it continues to grow. We're extremely privileged to have with us in studio today Professor Tandika Mkandawire to explore these issues and to then give us his insights in terms of what needs to be done, what has been done, and where Africa is at the moment. Professor Mkandawire is a former director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development based in Geneva, Switzerland. He is also the first person to take on the chair in African Development at the London School of Economics and Politics based in London, UK. He is currently the visiting professor at the University of Cape Town and a senior research fellow at the Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice. Professor Mkandawe, welcome to the program. Thank you. So we've heard a lot about you know, Africa's growth and there's this excitement about Africa rising and there's this general positivity about the continent. But kind of side by side with this has been this emerging discussion almost about economic transformation, which is slightly different. Uh, and so today I would like to explore this concept with you. What is the difference really when we, we start talking about transformation as opposed to growth? Well, in the first place, I think the, we've had some kind of recovery. You know, if you were to draw a, a curve of African economy's performance, it would look like an N. You know, you go up, you start from 1960, you go up, up to about 79, and then we begin declining from 80 up to 95, and then it goes up again. And so what we're talking about is this arm of this N. And so there is a recovery. There's no doubt about that. But it's a recovery. Most countries have now reached the per capita incomes that they had in the 70s. Okay. A recovery is much easier than economic growth. Okay. Because a recovery, you're using a lot of existing resources, uh, existing dams, existing human resources, and so forth. Going beyond that, uh, you need new resources, and new human capital, new... And so we see already most countries in Africa, for instance, they, you know, they are having serious problems with energy. There are blackouts everywhere because they've exhausted the existing capacity that was built in an earlier period. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that there has been no structural transformation. By that, I mean, we think of uh, beyond growth that the whole idea of development is that you're moving people from sectors of low productivity to those of high productivity. Historically, it's been moving from agriculture to industry or to high uh, productivity services. What we're seeing in Africa, which is quite unusual historically, is that people are moving from low productivity agriculture to low productivity services. So we really are not having any structural change. Partly because the industry has not kept up with the... Um, during this boom, you know, there's been no industrialization. If the boom, the first boom in the 70s, there was a relationship between the high growth of the economy and industrialization. There's been a decoupling now. Uh, so you have countries growing very rapidly and not, nothing's happening in the industrial sector. And that... Uh, historically is unusual. It has imp implications for that. It means that we have not been able to diversify our exports, for instance. You know? and, and if, as it happens, it's happening already, the prices of our one, one or two commodities we export decline, then the boom is affected. I mean, the recovery is affected. So still very fragile economies. Yes, so. yes. But if that's the case, you know, why is this why is it that we're now starting to talk in a bit more excited terms that growth is driving transformation and so on? Is that, is that just not true then? No, growth does not necessarily mean that... Uh, I mean, growth is important. It's a very important component. But, you know, if, if, if the growth is... So our, our type of growth that's happening, I said, the, the GDP is going up and the services... And, you know, the jobs which have been created are in low, low productivity services. And, and you have... A, and you're not diversifying your uh, base of production, and it's being driven by this one or two commodities, then you have what somebody has called uh, you know, uh, com consumer cities, you know, which just consume, they don't export anything. It's not sustainable, you know, because we're not producing manufactured products, we're not producing you know, anything. 
So our growth is, is, is fragile, extremely fragile. Sure. And you, you'd mentioned that really the growth is a, is a recovery. So yes. if, if that's the case, now if we've recovered to you know, the level that we were at before this kind of end yes, dip, yes, yes. are the fundamentals, as it were, in place for now a continued kind of, after having this pause, can yes. we now go and say, okay, everything is in place, we've now grown back to where we used to be, now we're ready to transform? I don't think so. I mean, before the recovery, it's quite interesting that a lot of policymakers, international, well, more directly, institutions like the World Bank and IMF and the other bilateral donors began to give a list of mistakes made, okay, uh, and that they had made mistakes in the 80s and 90s. And some of the mistakes included uh, lack of investment in human capital, because the World Bank pulled out of higher education, supporting higher education, and then, of course, the recipient governments did, did the same, that there had been a neglect of uh, infrastructure, and and that, that the, you know, the, the, the banking sector that emerged was not funding long-term projects. I mean, there's a whole series of uh, mea culpa, if you like. This was just before the recovery, okay? Then the recovery happens, and those mistakes are forgotten. Okay. Because people are caught up in the yeah, excitement. Yeah, we're all, we're all so. excited about, you know, now Africa booming and all that. But those mistakes have implications, okay? And, uh, and the point is that they have, you know, those, and, and we see it from time to time when we post all their blackouts now, they are, you know, the, the, uh, the traffic jams and all that, that, and, that they are, and that we have serious human capital problems. And that makes our recovery, that we were not, even during the recovery, because we had made, we had these mistakes there out there, we couldn't even trans translate the new gains into industry or you know, into, into transformation, tr trans transformative activities. So we, we are, in a sense, if we're not, you know, maybe now that people are aware of, um, governments are beginning to worry about, well, look, we've gone 20 years of recovery and we haven't done the following things, okay? I hope it's not too late, that I hope they can now say, look, let's, let's correct uh, the mistakes, especially with respect to infrastructure, higher education, you know, and, and all that. Unfortunately, this, this celebration that took place, or that, like, you know, that took place in the last, especially the last 10 years, made us, uh, you know, kind of in this euphoria, to forget the admissions of error that virtually, I mean, the World Bank has published all kinds of, I remember I was trying to count one time, something like 19 serious errors of, you know, that they've made, that they have written about themselves, you know, from uh, wrong, wrong privatization, sequencing of privatization, wrong sequencing of liberalization, to wrong sequencing of, of many reforms and, and so forth. And those things, if you, if you make those mistakes, you create an economy. And that economy will respond in a particular way. And, and, and one of the responses of that economy is that, given opportunities, it has not responded well. That's what we're, where we are now. That, you know, we, we do not have a robust base for even making benefits of the recovery. So in terms of now, if we, if we look at those kind of decision makers that, <coughs> that we entrust to, to tinker with you know, the policies, the infrastructure, the human resources, uh, investments and so on. Where do we see the biggest gaps in terms of, of Africa needing to address before really this transformative process can, can, can take off, as it were? Oh, well, there are many, many gaps. You know? One, for instance, is that African economies are low savings economies. Okay? Because co savings collapsed in the 80s and 90s. They haven't recovered much. Many governments, especially in the poorer countries, are low tax economies. The taxes declined. Uh, they removed certain taxes, and they said they would introduce uh, value-added taxes. Taxes have gone down. Infrastructure, as I said, human capital is an, a big problem. And you need to get those things in place. High savings, high investment, allocation. And you need institutions also which, are, which can handle or can translate your savings or your money into long-term investments. We don't have that. So you need some serious institutional reforms, some serious... Uh, process of accumulation of savings and investment to fund your infrastructure, to fund your higher education and all that. And as I said, you know, there were, 
there's a lot of debate in Africa was behind about what was behind the recovery. So one has perhaps to go back a little bit. The most, in most documents you see in the multilaterals, they will say something about because of improved macroeconomic policies. And I don't think that, you know, this is quite, quite this is strange because, uh, as I said, just before uh, 1995, when the recovery starts, there was a lot of writing by the multinationals themselves why Africa is not growing and what has gone wrong with structural adjustment and the lots of studies were published by multinationals. So for them to claim now is a little, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, but there were four other factors, at least two, two, three other factors that I would think accounted for, account for the recovery. One, the obvious is the improved prices eh, for commodities. Perhaps step back again. You have to find out which of these factors that are named here, which are one-off and which are more or less permanent. So you have improved terms of trade. This is the longest uh, price boom for Africa since the Second World War. It's, you know, it's been going on for almost since 1995. And it's unusual because it's also very widespread. It's not just like the one in the 70s when oil countries, you know, this has been, a lot of commodities have, have benefited. And the driver of that is not Africa itself, that's the No, it's external, market. it's yeah. external. And this, this, the second big driver is investment in IT, you know. And, you know, there were huge investments going into the uh, IT industry. And from what I understand, the costly part of it, which is building these towers and all that, that phase is over for a while, okay? The third, related perhaps to the first one, was investment in mining. Okay. Huge investments in mining. That, again, is, can be one off. So the three factors you know, cannot be relied upon to, 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 you know, to sustain it themselves, because they're you know, they they exogenous, as the economists would, would say. The only endogenous factor, I think, has been improved governance. Okay. African governments now think that to, um, you know, for the first time in African since independence, performing well economically matters for the, for the donors, okay? And, I mean, for the, I'm sorry, for the government. And governments are, you know, they, they pride themselves for the growth rate. They'll say, you know, my country is growing 6% and the owner said 7%. I remember when the Kenyan government, during the Kenyan inauguration, the uh, uh, vice president asking the question, why is Ethiopia growing faster than we are? That's unusual in African history. It's almost like a competition. Yes, that that's the only source of legitimacy. You can no longer say I'm a father of the nation or, you know, um, or I'm a general. You, know, you have to perform economically. So that is, the, that is probably the only really indigenous part of the story, improved governance. It's important. I mean, it's extremely important. I, mean, uh, I think African countries normally when when the governance is reasonable, they do well economically. I mean, it's a bit concerning if, if really the drivers of, of growth and therefore, by extension, the drivers of transformation really are not under you know, so-called African control. Uh, and if we've had the kind of mea culpa documentation, yes. is, it a, is it just the reality that we as Africans, as our decision makers, our policy makers, our, our, our kind of st strategists, have not actually taken the time to understand what the drivers of transformation are that they can control and then invest accordingly. Is that, I mean, is that a fair assessment of the situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, the things that countries that grow rapidly over a, for a long period that they, they try to control is investment and savings, for instance. Our banking reforms that we made in the 80s are not good for that. You know? They have not been able to increase savings. And we built a lot of institutions like, you know, stock markets, you know, and they, they, they were supposed to raise savings. They have not done that. And historically, for late industrializers, you need special financial institutions, um, uh, development banks, and so forth. They were condemned in the 80s. So we, we don't have, we actually don't have institutions uh, for funding long-term uh, development. One. Two, on higher education, big mistakes were made. And the World Bank wrote a very big report together with UNESCO where basically they said it was a mistake that what they said in the 80s. I don't think the African governments have taken measures to redress that, you know. 
uh, and to say that we've lost uh, 20 years of human capital formation, and let's do something, you know, you know, rapid to correct this uh, terrible mistake. And as I said, because of this celebratory, you know, this euphoria about the, the recovery, the notions that they, they were, you know, there's a backlog of things to be done, you know. You see it mentioned sometimes, well, there's a backlog of infrastructure to be constructed. But, I don't think we, but that means raising your investment ratios much more than we have now. Uh, but that means creating financial institutions which were banned under the structural adjustment process. You know? And so we don't have institutions for funding long-term projects. Yeah, and so this is now that transformation that, that, it, that is needed in order to sustain growth over longer periods, but then also the underlying transformation of the society that, that takes place. I mean, shifting from low productivity in, in, in primary sectors into industrialization and so on, that causes a major change in how your society is structured. Yeah, that's one thing which is kind of puzzling about Africa. If usually you think of a urbanization meaning people move to low productivity, to high productivity uh, activities, and, and, and Africa is urbanizing rapidly, but it's urbanizing pretty much the wrong way. And through poverty and escaping. To, yeah, and, and so in on. fact, poverty in Africa now is being urbanized. Okay, mm. so that's not very good. And and I have a colleague, a demographer, who claims that that's all right because he says that this urbanization will create a labor force, which will attract capital to, to build industry in Africa. That he claims that um, that's how what happened in Britain or something like that. Uh, he may be correct, you know, I don't know. But I, I but I, I think that if there is, and people often say also that Africa is going to be a youth, you know, this uh, this huge demographic dividend, you know, with the, uh, the bulge of the youth. Uh, but whether you benefit from that uh, bulge of youth, you have to educate. The population must be educated. The young people must be educated. And that's very, and I don't see that happening, you know, uh, you know at least in a, in, a, in a systematic way. I think we, we you know, as I said, we, we all say that uh, these this were lost decades, you know, and, but we haven't really understood the full implication of that. On the positive side, on the, on, the, on the sort of promising side, of course, Africa is rich in natural resources. But that wealth will only uh, you know, benefit us if we, and Ewo talks about it now, if we add value. But add value means you industrialize. Okay? But we still have problems arguing to have, you know, to have an industrial policy. Uh, you have to have an industrial policy uh, to find with how much of the raw materials can be transformed locally, and how much can be consumed in Africa. People, you know, we often think of, uh, uh, you know, there's a decline of demand of uh, certain raw materials like steel and you know, that in China, because China is going through, has gone through this, you know, cement and steel you know, period of accumulation, but Africa hasn't. So Africa must be potentially one of the big markets for its own. You know, uh, steel and cement, you know, it's, it's sort of stuff that people use at the early phase of development. Uh, so it means rethinking, once again, uh, the whole idea of regional markets and integration to make use of some of this stuff for which the demand may have gone down in the rest of the world, but for which Africa has not yet uh, so begun to use. That <coughs> yes, yes, yes. But you've mentioned a few times now that what is happening in Africa is, is, is somehow unique, you know, like this urbanization of poverty, for example, and, and how it's a recovery. Are there no lessons that you know, Africa as a whole or countries within Africa can take from, say, you know, Asia, which is usually the comparison, but elsewhere like Europe or South America, for example? Are there no, are there no conditions or, or policies or, or kind of underlying institutions that Africa can pin to and say, that's something that we could learn from, if not, maybe not as a copy-paste kind mm -hmm. of approach, but at least to understand the principle that drove this. Because Asia has, you know, industrialized yes. and has taken off and, in a way, left Africa yes. behind. Is there anything we can learn from them? There's a lot. I mean, we can learn a lot. I mean, and, uh, but, uh, I mean, we can learn a lot. I mean, the, the, the role of the state, the role of uh, domestic capital, the importance of uh, mobilizing your resources and, uh, and 
acquiring technology and all those things. No, the, 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 the lessons are there. But there's a discourse on Africa which is quite amazing in terms of uh, its, its view of Africans, which will say something like, okay, Asia did this, 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 but Africans cannot do it. And why is that? Oh, well, they'll say either because when neo patrimonial Africa cannot do that, or they'll say well, it's too late because of WTO, or because there's a whole list of things, uh, what I once called impossibility theorems of development. You know, Africa cannot have a developmental state, Africa can. And they're repeated as, you know, uh, almost as a, they're talking about a biological condition. You know, you ask, why can't, why is it that something, every latecomer, mm. every has followed that, you know, from. From the U.S., you know, uh, the first import substitution was uh, um, the American Alexander Hamilton. Why would it suddenly become uh, the situation be that Africa cannot do that? You know, that's uh, that's one of the big puzzles. Of, and and sometimes Africans begin to believe themselves. You know? oh, that's, the worst thing about, just, that's the worst thing. That's worst thing. Is Africa's, that a narrative that's out there, or is that yes, something yes. that is has now been internalized? Yeah, so that you know, you, they will mention to you. They, they will also list how, uh, yeah, you know, in 1993 when there was a report by the World Bank on the, uh, the Asian economic miracle, where the World Bank, for the first time, admits that the state was very important. Mm. In the 1994 report on the World, on the World, from the World Bank, they just pointed out that, however, this cannot happen in Africa. And that's that. That's it. And, and, uh, and so on, and they, then they, you know, since they believe that, uh, then you are not allowed to introduce those institutions that were used by Asia mm -hmm. to, to catch up. Now, every country to catch up has to, of course, create new institutions. And they may not necessarily be the same thing about uh, Asia. And in fact, the whole idea of catching up is that you can leapfrog. You know? So some of the things that Asians did may not be necessary. For I don't believe that repression of labor is, is necessary, for instance. Okay? Uh, it was a condition maybe that they found they thought was suitable, but I don't think it's necessary. So you can leapfrog, leapfrog all that stuff, but you have to have room for trial and error, for experimentation. Now, in the era of the way policy making is, and our, our, our donor friends, as they call them, uh, African governments are interpreted always as never making errors. Whatever they do is because they're clientelistic or they're, you know, they're rent seekers, there's no, uh, so there's no room for trial and error. You make one mistake, you're punished immediately. <laughs> you know, and, uh, is that a result of, of sort of aid funding in ODA or, or is this a, a governance issue that we don't allow our, our governments or our leaders to be innovative with public institutions and with these kind of fundamentals of of transformation, like this, the pressure is to get it right so that we can catch up, and getting it wrong sends us back. Yeah, I mean, look, places like China have made huge mistakes. And people, when the Chinese made, had a great leap forward, <laughs> it was very costly. And and when you ask Chinese about, uh, you know, what do you think about Mao Zedong after that, all that big leap forward, that you know, Cultural. then they'll say, well, you see, uh, they often give you sort of three reasons. Well, he was. Uh, you know, he, he helped China to, uh, he, he, he kept China together. So you can say Nyerere did the same thing here. Then they say he gave China a sense of self-respect. And the third, which always I think is remarkable, that he gave Chinese a sense of, that, uh, I, that good ideas come from practice, that you, know, you, you, you try, try and error. Uh, which was also in Europe, uh, the idea of the Renaissance was trial and error. You know, the, the truth was not in the Vatican. It was through experimentation. So each, you know, those elements of any country which is starting up, you know, trying to catch up, some self-confidence self and the willingness to experiment, to try and, you know, and build up. There's a lot of fear in Africa about trying things out, you know, for all kinds of reasons which are very complicated to explain here. But, but, but one advantage which we might, we can exploit, which is that Africa is very young, demographically. So if, uh, so you have a whole population out there which is young, and we see it's trying all kinds of new things. I mean, the, you know, the, the, uh, and, uh, and so we can exploit that fact that Africa is the youngest continent, you know, on earth, you know, so. 
Let me, uh, uh, we're, we're a bit pressed for time, unfortunately. Yeah. So just as a kind of final thought, as it were, although it's still a very complex and an open discussion, if we're looking to transform Africa as is today, yes. you know, what you know, two, three things really need to be at the top of the priority lists in order for, for us to be able to, to make that step and to make that transformation that can sustain the recovery and move it into, into growth? One, I would place, for lack of any better word, uh, an inclusive process of development that is fundamentally democratic. That's, I, I, I really believe that. Two, we are blessed with resources. So, so Africa is not, uh, you know, and, and to find ways of using those resources. But to do that, you need huge investments in human, you know, in human capacity. If you do that, the three of them, because I don't believe Africa can be governed by authoritarian rule. I've got my own theory about that. But, but plus, also have a moral obli uh, objection to any other form of governance. And in any case, in Africa, our dictators don't do well. So that's not a good option. But really, if we find ways of uh, mobilizing our natural resources, but that requires huge investments in human capital. We sh Africa should be able to, 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 to transform itself. Look, economic development is not as complicated as it's meant to do. If you, if you grow and, and you have some sense of transformation for the next 30, 40 years, a content changes. You know, you know, Korea is not a long time ago. I mean, it's, if you think of it, like, if you, and when you go to Korea, you can see that this is it's new, and the buildings are new. It's, and so it's, yeah, it can be done, you know? In, in, uh, in a, uh, and, and I don't see, but we have to really, take control of the project of developing Africa. Many of those who have tried to guide our development have failed miserably. And as I said, in the 90s, there was a whole writing of many culpas and you know, where we went wrong and all that. You know. And uh, you'd expect them to say, OK, we made a mistake. Now we step aside. For, you know. But somehow they're, <laughs> they're back again, you know, some of them. And uh, there was somebody once, it was Dudley Sears, asked a question about, why do failed economists visit? And no, why do fail, no, the first one was, why do visiting economists fail? The second one was, why do failed economists visit? So I see the same names that were behind the disaster of the 90s. Now they have, some of them have come back now as specialists in infrastructure. And, and, and you ask, how, when, when did this person become an expert on that? Anyway, we have to be self-confident that we can transform the continent. And this, as I said, is Chinese lessons, that at some point you, you make up, you know, you decide that you will try to do it yourself as much as you can. You know. And that anybody coming here has to subject, uh, has, have, has to be aware that we have a project. You know. They can either be part of it or get out of the way. You know. Sure. Well, well, on that note, I'll, I'll end the interview. And thank you very much thank for your time and for, for, for your wisdom and sharing it with oh, us. Right. And welcome back to, to the program at any other point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and thank you at home for tuning in. And we hope to see you again on another episode of In Focus brought to you by the Ongozi Institute. Goodbye.